that's to me it's it's not a it's it's a poor poor form so we're all, we're almost there so it's good to good to see you and uh great to see your enthusiasm and energy so as always see all right well we're at we're at it we really have a it's exciting to see such a great crowd uh, uh on behalf of our interim leadership, Dr. Harry Van Loveren, uh, who is our interim chairman, and Dr. Fayyad Youssef. Uh, I would like to um, welcome everybody back. My name is Joe Lazama. I'm the vice chair of education for the Department of Internal Medicine. I know we have a lot of new residents and a lot of new fellows and, and several new faculty members who have joined us since we last did Grand mm -hmm. Rounds. Um, it is uh, great to be back. Uh, Jen, Jennifer Newcomb is our Grand Rounds administrator and is to be thanked for a wonderful job she does every year in getting us ready for Grand Round season. You'll be seeing notices from Jennifer Newcomb on upcoming Grand Rounds and on getting your uh, continuing education credit. Uh, please read uh, her entire email, which will have uh, a lot of great information in there. So um, leading off our Roy Benke, uh, University of South Florida Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds, we we have a very special faculty member. Um, I'm very proud of him as a fellow Latino physician. Um, Dr. Juan Carlos Cardet will be our speaker today, and he is an associate professor, congratulations on the promotion, associate professor in the Department of Allergy and Immunology here at USF College of Medicine, Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, Juan Carlos is a graduate of Harvard University, where he started his undergraduate, his, his is uh, post high school calling career. Campus General Hospital. We oh, we got somebody. Yeah, there we go. Thank number. you for muting. Oh, Jennifer, if you could mute that. Thanks. So Juan Carlos, after he graduated uh, from Harvard, went to the University of Puerto Rico for medical school, and uh, then went off to finish residency in the at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he completed his fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital, at, uh, during which time he also picked up his master's of public health at Harvard. Uh, we have been delighted to have Juan Carlos on faculty uh, for the last several years. Uh, Juan Carlos is a, a very successful re researcher with funding from multiple sources to include the NIH and the American Lung Association. Uh, he is an incredible mentor to not only the allergy and immunology fellows, but also the internal medicine residents and the medical students of the University of South Florida College of Medicine. So today, Juan Carlos will be talking about a very important topic, uh, asthma. His title is Asthma Diagnosis Management and uh, um, updated and important updates and treatment guidelines. Uh, Juan Carlos, again, a pleasure to have you, and I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, happy to be here. Proud to be here. Um, I'll talk to you guys about asthma. I'm Juan Carlos Cardet from the Allergy Division. This is the outline from a talk. Questions, keep in mind, so what, what are the uh, clinical characteristics of asthma? Were there any asthma phenotype specific treatments? And then a question, this is gonna be a main focus, whether albuterol alone should be used as a rescue inhaler in asthma. I would also like to take this opportunity to showcase uh, some of the research projects that our residents and fellows have been conducting. So I'll show you uh, the results. So to start off, clinical characteristics, the symptoms are these four. They they should come as a sing song, just write it, you know, it be very present in your in your head. And so the four symptoms of asthma, shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, chest tightness. Notice that none of these are absolutely required for asthma. There's such a thing as cough variant asthma. That's all they they express. And none of these is pathognomonic for asthma. It, you know, not all that wheezes is asthma, so they say, right? So it's, uh, it's, there's uh, some detective work that you as a clinician should do. In terms of spirometry, it's usually reversible air, airflow obstruction. We'll go over that pretty soon. But if you treat uh, your patients, especially with inhaled corticosteroids, this reversibility component, you may not catch it uh, during spirometric evaluation. And same for airway hyperresponsiveness. Um, everybody's um, and all 8 billion of us, uh, we have some high uh, responsiveness of our airways, the, the different stimuli, 
the asthmatic is an asthmatic because they hyper respond. Um, and that can also uh, be attenuated if you properly treat them. In terms of pathology, there's airway inflammation or remodeling, and I'll show you a slide to give you more specifics on that. To give you some epi and context about uh, why this disease, uh, we need to keep focusing on that and try to reduce its morbidity. It's, it's very common, most common chronic uh, 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 obstructive airway disease um, in the US, about 300 million people worldwide. That's a lot of people with asthma. In terms of morbidity, uh, close to 2 million ER visits per year, close to 12 million outpatient visits. Um, in more than 400,000 hospitalizations per year, consistently top 10 costliest chronic diseases. By some estimates, and Dr. Lockie debates this, uh, but it's projected to be $960 billion in the US alone over the next uh, 20 years. And despite all the uh, advances, basic science advances, clinical research advances that we've had in asthma over the past 20 years, there's still more than 4,000 people dying from this disease uh, per year in the US alone. This is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, it's been called, there's not one asthma, very many different asthmas. Uh, this is from a review by uh, Shilpa Tonk. She just graduated from her fellowship, but it, you can categorize the disease by age of onset, the type of granulocytes in the sputum, that by severity, resistance to steroid, how often they get exacerbations, how much they progress in terms of airflow obstruction. And I'll talk to you about these at the end, uh, a specific treatments for AERD or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease or Samter's triad. So asthma, nasal polyps and stereotypical respiratory reactions to as, uh, aspirin and other NSAIDs. And also obese asthma, we'll talk about that too. This is uh, from a review uh, from now dated, now dated, it's from 2017. Uh, New England Journal uh, for severe asthma, but pretty much you can also find this in mild asthma. And these are the features. Uh, there's an increase in airway smooth muscle, both in terms of hyperplasia and hypertrophy. There's characteristic inflammation. I'll show you what exactly, what type of inflammation in the next slide. There is increased mucus production from uh, goblet cell hyperplasia. Uh, you can see it in gr nasty green in the uh, picture. There's epithelial fragility. There's subepithelial fibrosis, specifically the lamina reticularis, and for example, um, atopic cough and eosinophilic bronchitis, similar disease uh, characteristics like symptoms, and, uh, uh, for example, but they don't have this feature, which is mast cells interspersed in the airway smooth muscle layer. And all of these uh, pathobiological features, they lead to asthma attacks and asthma symptoms and airway narrowing. This is the uh, current paradigm. This is also from Shilpa's review, and it goes, essentially it goes from top to bottom. At the top, what do you see? All the, uh, the those different insults, uh, allergens, viruses, bacteria, cigarettes, uh, vaping, pollutants, physical injury, all of that is that in that light blue or gray, or um, that's in the airway lumen. And all those uh, different stimuli, they inter interact with the airway epithelium which releases, and you can see it right there, uh, alarmins, uh, thymic stromal lymphopoietin and trilucan 25 and 33. These, these in our way of thinking are very important because they instruct uh, important cells like dendritic cells and innate lymphoid cells uh, type two to then release other cytokines that are crucial to the type of uh, inflammation that's most common in asthma, which is type two inflammation, which is canonically characterized by interleukin four, five, and 13, which act on other cells like B cells to isotype switch. Instead of IgG, they now make IgE, which is related in allergies, um, but also uh, T helper cells, uh, it skews them, the, that uh, Th2 uh, phenotype. There's also non-type 2 asthma. It's mostly characterized by uh, neutrophilic asthma, um, and it's often characterized by Th17 cells. Interleukin-6 uh, would be released from the aerobithelium and then uh, lead to the skewing from Th naive to Th17. Um, the type of inflammation that you can see in uh, type uh, Type 2 inflammation is often eosinophilic. That's uh, from the influence of IL-5. Um, it can or cannot uh, occur in the context of allergies. 
Um, when it's non-type 2, it's often neutrophilic, but it can also, there's some people who have no inflammation. They just have um, uh, airway hyper-responsiveness, and it's posse granulocytic, so no inflammation. And you can see um, throughout this uh, figure that there's many different biologic drugs. Monoclonal antibodies are targeting precisely uh, these cytokines and these uh, important cells and mediators for asthma, and we have that available uh, to us now. What the, per the person with asthma has more of these bronchoconstrictors, many of these released by mast cells, but also greater sensitivity to those, and there's also greater uh, chemotactic cytokines attracting inflammation to the airway. Every single, like I said before, it's a heterogeneous disease, and the type of mediator in the cell that is predominant in a single asthmatic um, varies. We have some biomarkers, but we're not at the level of endotyping or the uh, specific disease mechanism that underlies their phen phenotype. That's, that's what we're looking for right now. So uh, first part of the lecture, the summary is uh, asthma is highly prevalent, burdensome, no pathognomonic clinical symptoms. You need to be a detective. We'll talk some more about that now. Highly heterogeneous, and we're looking for better endotyping. By the way, I'm talking a lot. If at any point anybody has any questions, please ask away. And Jen, if you can let me know because I can't see if uh, people are raising their hands. Got it, got it. Perfect, thank you. So uh, some more on diagnosis. So symptoms, we heard about it, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, coughing. More likely to be asthma if it's more than one simultaneously. Wheezing is often most classically expiratory. You can have both, you can have biphasic, but it's expiratory. Air goes in, but it's like a one-way valve. There's uh, gas trapping uh, in, um, in the lung, in asthma and other uh, obstructive airway diseases. That's why it's expiratory. That's, that's what makes the, the whistling sound. Wheezing is episodic. If it's continuous, you need to think about other uh, other pathologies. Maybe it's an upper airway fixed obstruction. Maybe it's a kid that swallowed a peanut or a coin or something like that. It's fixed. We asked specifically about nocturnal symptoms of asthma or uh, waking up earlier than usually uh, than usual in the morning with asthma. Stereotypical triggers include viral inf infections. That's the trigger for asthma in more than 90% of the cases in kids, at least two thirds in adults. Allergens drive the disease in both uh, kids and many adults as well. They have a hype, like I said before, everybody reacts to irritants, but the asthmatic is so because it reacts some more to uh, irritants like bleach. Exercise uh, is a, a known uh, bronchoconstrictor, specifically in the asthmatic. Maybe, maybe you have uh, seen this in a group when people are laughing, the person with asthma after laughing uh, gets an asthma attack or asthma symptoms and cold air is often a trigger. If exercise, make sure that the patient reports that their shortness of breath happens after exercise. If it happens just before, maybe it's anticipatory anxiety, which is often comorbid with asthma. If it's like a minute or two into the exercise, think vocal cord dysfunction, also highly comorbid, especially in severe asthma. If albuterol and other bronchodilators, they work in almost every single uh, person with asthma, so expect an improvement with therapy. If it does absolutely nothing, be highly suspicious that it might not be asthma. Signs, polyphonic. So there's an, uh, one single uh, trachea, and after that, there's a bifurcation, and then they bifurcate, and, and again, and again, and again, and it's the, the number is uh, exponential. So each one of those uh, air, little airways is going to be uh, obstructed, producing a different quality sound. This is why it's polyphonic, many different sounds, expiratory. Frequently, it's normal. It's an episodic disease. Just before they show, just because they show up at your clinic, they're not having any wheezing, any symptoms. Does not mean they don't have asthma. And for people who work at the ER, if they're severely obstructed, they're not moving any air. Be aware of the so-called silent chest. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about flow volume loops. Normal, the one on the right. Uh, notice uh, the expiratory phase, it's what's above um, the, uh, the X axis, and the inspiratory phase is below the X axis. You should, uh, the, the distance and the Y axis of that third middle point should be equivalent. That's normal, right? 
when what you like I said before, asthma and COPD, right, are diseases, are obstructive diseases, and it's the expiratory phase that's intrapulmonary that's affected, right? So um, the flow uh, is reduced in the expiratory phase. That's why they call it the witch's hat. And you can tell it because the distance and the inspiratory phase is much, much, much bigger than the expiratory phase at this middle point. Um, this is from the American Academy of Family Physicians. I think it's pretty straightforward and simple and good to use. So assess for first, assess for obstruction, uh, FEV1 over FEC ratio. Th first thing to look at in spirometry or pulmonary function tests. Less than 70, obstruction present. Then um, assess the severity, and there's the thresholds for mild, moderate, and severe. Look for possible restriction. If it's uh, less than if it's less than 80 percent, then it might have restriction, but it might also be due to air trapping, compressing on that FVC capacity, right? So if you find an FVC less than 80 percent, you should get uh, a plethysmography, so full PFTs where you can get the uh, uh, total lung capacity, get a uh, DLCO, if it's, uh, and measure um, the uh, residual volume that gets away uh, air trapping. If the uh, TLC is less than 90%, then it, it's, it confirms that restrictive lung disease. You can get a DLCO to see if there's uh, emphysema. We'll talk some more about that uh, pretty soon. And you can uh, assess the degree of air trapping. Uh, these are some more examples of flow volume loops. Notice the one is specifically the second one from right to left. Um, that's vocal cord dysfunction. Notice that this one is flipped, right? At that middle point, the one, the uh, flow that is reduced is, is on the inspiratory phase. This is good to get and look at the flow volume loops and get comfortable with that. It, because like I said, severe asthma, 50% or so, according to National Jewish, uh, you get vocal cord dysfunction as comorbid with severe asthma. And look at if you're seeing, if you're thinking about restrictive disease uh, in, as a possible comorbid diagnosis or as an alt alternative diagnosis, notice that it's like the normal one in terms of the magnitude of the flow, but the volumes are squished. How do you assess for the uh, uh, reversibility and airflow obstruction? So it's a 12% increase in FEV1 after two puffs of albuterol, 10 minutes after two puffs of albuterol. And because that, that percentage might be skewed in extremes of very small FEV1s or very big FEV1s, so specifically in, in small ones, you need to, you need to see a, at least a 200 milliliter increase in FEV1 to call it a reversibility. Like anything in life and anything in science, everything is, exists on a continuum. And, you know, whether somebody at 11%, we can adequately say, oh, this person does not have asthma, no uh, obstructive airway disease. Um, maybe you're not catching this person at the right time. Like I said, if you properly treat a, a patient with inhaled corticosteroids and other therapies for asthma, that reversibility might go away. In terms of airway hyperresponsiveness, I often get the uh, methacholine PC20 provocative concentration to cause a 20% drop in FEV1. I rarely do these in clinical practice. Essentially, when I really want to convince myself and the patient that they don't have asthma and something else, uh, we can do this test. It's available, for example, at Tampa General Hospital. Um, but then again, you're giving something, methacholine, right? It's a, it's a muscarinic receptor agonist. It causes bronchoconstriction and people feel it. It's reversible. It's, it's generally safe. It's clinically available, but people feel it. So people generally don't want to do this, and I don't want to do this to people if I can avoid it, but it's useful for research. For the differential diagnosis, it's vast, as you can see on screen, but uh, chronic upper airway cough syndrome or post-nasal drip coughing, uh, causing cough. Remember, there is cough variant asthma. COPD uh, is, a, is an important uh, one in differential diagnosis. The other major uh, chronic obstructive uh, disease, aside from asthma, I've said this before, vocal cord dysfunction. It's a mimicker and a comorbid condition, but CHF and uh, volume overload for chronic uh, kidney disease, that's also important to, to consider. Um, comorbid contributory conditions. When patients have GERD, even if they're treated with H2, H2 blockers or PPIs, and you've uh, essentially made less acidic uh, the uh, stomach acid, 
it's acid going down the wrong pipe, right? It's causing inflammation. This is consistently identified in research, regardless of what place in the world the research is conducted in. The presence of uh, GERD with asthma makes the asthma worse. It might be a vicious circle between the two of them. Worse air trapping might worsen the GERD as well. Obesity with, with and without the metabolic syndrome, that's an important one. It makes uh, people uh, more asthma uh, prone, uh, asthma exacerbation prone, uh, less resist, uh, more resistant uh, the control of therapy for asthma and worsens quality of life and worsens symptoms. Um, chronic rhinositis uh, alone is a, a risk factor for return ER visits for asthma. Nasal polyposis is consistently a risk factor for uh, worse asthma exacerbations, anxiety disorders, other psychiatric illnesses, again, it's like a feed forward mechanism. Anxiety gives you asthma, asthma gives you anxiety. Commonly a, a known risk factor for worse asthma. Nuances at adult asthma, five to 20% it's work related. Somebody who's never had asthma in their life and they're 45 or something like that, and then they, they start complaining of asthma type symptoms, think, what are they doing in their workplace? What are they doing at home? things that they do the daily life of a human being is is predictive of the types of diseases they're going to get that's a, a ancient medical knowledge right and it's true the er elderly uh, seem to be underdiagnosed uh, with asthma and you can help out uh, uh, tremendously patients uh, uh, who are old because sometimes they attribute the shortness of breath to deconditioning or to getting old and sometimes it's not. Sometimes they do have asthma like somebody else and you can make a diff big difference in quality of life. And remarkably, this is so remarkable. Uh, people with asthma smoke as frequently or more frequently than people without asthma. Same is true for vaping, same is true for cannabis use. Why is that? It's, it's behavior, human nature, and there's a psychology behind it. But if you can, uh, an intervention that you can do and in my personal experience in clinic is if you can do something to at least reduce the amount of uh, smoke or vapor or, or cannabis use, you can make a tremendous difference in their quality of life. So second summary, uh, clinical history, physical and spirometry, those volume, uh, flow volume loops are all very helpful. That's what you need. That's the type of detective work that you need. Broad differential diagnosis. Uh, we didn't go over the entire list. You should uh, take a look at it, but not all that wheezes or coughs or has chest tightness or shortness of breath is asthma. Identify and treat the comorbidities and your patients will thank you for it. This is uh, a focus that I wanted to have uh, and give you uh, for this lecture, which is uh, changes to the treatment guidelines and it's to the question whether we should be giving albuterol alone. Um, and the point uh, that, that drives that discussion is that the overuse of short-acting beta agonists alone for rescue therapy is associated with asthma-related morbidity. So beta agonists bronchodilate, but they don't reduce inflammation. And the vast majority of people uh, with asthma, it's an inflammatory airway disease. So they treat themselves with beta agonists, which don't reduce inflammation. And if they use too much the beta agonist, there's a loss of bronchoprotection and tolerance for regular use. Relatively uh, recently from the uh, European Respiratory Journal, large Swedish uh, national registry followed up for a long time. Just focus on the upper uh, uppermost uh, set of points, um, treatment steps one through four. So regardless of the asthma severity, which is dictated by the treatment step, the more canisters per year of short-acting beta agonists that patients refill, the higher the hot hazard ratio of them getting asthma attacks uh, subsequently. This is true regardless of severity, as you can see on screens, treatment step one, two, three, or four. And that's not just a Swedish phenomenon. There's similar data from throughout the planet. Um, inhaled corticosteroids are a centerpiece of asthma. The problem is we, we have this dichotomy, oh, this is controller therapy, and then the, this is rescue therapy. And the rescue therapy, it's only a beta agonist so far. You know, the pa existing paradigm for the past like four decades has been that. Ask anybody in the lay public, what do you treat for asthma? And they'll say a, a puffer. And what puffer? Albuterol, short acting beta agonist alone. And then we rely on patients on taking daily controller therapy 
which based on inhaled corticosteroids, but adherence is dismally low. Nobody likes to take medication that they don't need, and it's an episodic disease. So when they don't have symptoms, they don't take any medicine. However, and some of the, these data I'm going to show you now show that as needed use of inhaled corticosteroids driven by symptoms can improve asthma outcomes. And this is now endorsed by the uh, international report guidelines and the American guidelines. This is the most updated version of the international report, uh, Global Initiative for Asthma. This was updated in uh, May this year. Notice for track one, the one on top, preferred controller and reliever therapy. They now endorse, and they have been doing so for a few years, as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroids plus formoterol. Formoterol is a long acting beta agonist, as you know, but it's quick onset, time to onset, eight minutes. Albuterol, short acting beta agonist, time to onset, five minutes, close enough. So this idea has been bounced around and investigated for the past like several decades now. Um, the problem is, as needed to use a budesonide, specifically budesonide for motorol, is not FDA approved for rescue in this country, which at least in my clinic, unless they're very mild, uh, the, asthma, the person with asthma is very mild, I cannot get somebody on step three or step four that do this so-called SMART therapy, SMART for single maintenance and reliever therapy with low dose inhaled corticosteroid budesonide and for motorol. In response, and this is why Gina updated the guidelines, um, the control alternative reliever is as needed inhaled corticosteroid short acting beta agonist, which a pharmaceutical company is about to release into the market in Q1 of 2024, uh, coming soon, a product to address this FDA uh, warning against you as needed use of um, budesonide uh, for motorol. It's an alternative the, um, the that smart strategy that I told you about, and it's a way to supplement with inhaled corticosteroids instead of just using short-acting beta agonist albuterol alone. This is from the American guidelines. The GINA uh, international guidelines get updated whenever pretty frequently, at least like once a year. The American guidelines get updated every 10 years. Um, An APP EPR3 came out in 2007. This one came out in 20, December 2020. And notice that for step two, they're now endorsing as needed concomitant use of inhaled corticosteroids and short acting beta agonist. And then for step three, it's this smart therapy I've been telling you about single maintenance and reliever therapy with inhaled corticosteroids and for motorol. Where does the smart therapy come from? This is one of the original trials from Paul O'Byrne and others. Um, essentially, double-blind, randomized, parallel group uh, clinical trial, broad age uh, ranges, 4 to 80. They were uh, already on inhaled corticosteroids, 400 to 1,000 micrograms per, per day, had a history of exacerbation and remained uncontrolled dis despite that. They were randomized to three different groups. So look, the existing paradigm would be the best one, the main comparison, right? would be use inhaled corticosteroid and for motorol on a daily basis, and then use that short acting beta agonist alb albuterol. And that's the uh, dotted lines shows the pa patients with severe exacerbations. You know, as the days go by over the year, about 30% of people experience an exacerbation. But look, when they use that smart therapy, single maintenance and reliever therapy with budesonide ICS and for motorol, um, it's about a 40% drop in made analyses of a smart therapy. It's about a 30% drop in exacerbations. If you ask your patients to use inhaled corticosteroids combined with formoterol in a single inhaler as control therapy and as reliever therapy. It's not FDA. Dr. Carnett, can I interrupt for a second? Yep. Got a couple of questions. Go. Um, does it apply to exercise induced asthma? The smart therapy. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. I, I would need to, to look at that. That specifically, most of the uh, most of the trials have been looking at that outcome of exacerbations, whether or not uh, it helps with asthma control and quality of life and other metrics like exercise induced bronchoconstriction. 
it's more spotty in in that in those outcomes it's a very consistent signal with exacerbations but in other outcomes i'm not sure and a second question is would you consider salmeterol as a quick acting beta agonist similar to formoterol no the onset of action of salmeterol is about 35 minutes or something like that it doesn't work all right that's it yeah. So in response, the, the FDA not, not really approving for, for smart therapy, right? And uh, which poses insurance companies might not pay for it, for example, because exactly what, what somebody asked about, oh, but you have this other ICS LABA, uh, which is ICS Salmeterol on a formulary now. They're going to pay for that one. They're not going to pay for ICS for Motorol. So patients, are, they don't get it. It's too, it's too expensive. Um, that's one of the reasons. The other one uh, that often happens is if you prescribe it, um, let's say somebody with moderate severe asthma, right? Single maintenance and reliever therapy, you prescribe it just like that. Use it every single day and use it for, as needed. If they use both for maintenance and reliever, they're going to run out of that inhaler quicker than they're due for the refill. So, they go back to the pharmacy and they ask for the refill and they're going to say, no, you're not due for your refill yet. And in that time that they have no control therapy for asthma, they're very liable for getting an asthma attack. So it doesn't work. In response, a pharmaceutical company came up with in a single inhaler, albuterol, budesonide. Uh, so ICS Saba for rescue use. So this is the Mandala trial. For, this is from New England Journal last year. Um, among uh, individuals, teenagers and adults, moderate severe asthma, high dose ICS alone or high dose ICS plus LABA. There was a 26% reduction uh, when they used uh, the higher dose ICS and albuterol versus albuterol alone. And again, this is going to be available uh, in the market next year in a couple of months. Um, what we did and at least uh, 47 patients uh, out of these uh, 1,201 were recruited right here at USF uh, was uh, from the uh, PREPARE trial. Um, we recruited total in the country uh, 1,201 Black and Latinx adults with moderate severe asthma. They, ha I, they were had to be prescribed ICS at least or something more complex, at least like 25 different permutations of control therapy. They needed to have uncontrolled asthma or at least one more or more exacerbations in the past year. So our intervention was since the ICS Saba didn't exist and because smart therapy was not available, is not available in this country, let's give them something that is compatible with insurances, is compatible with the FDA does not frown upon, which is keep doing whatever it is your clinician tells you to do to control asthma. But every time that you puff yourself with albuterol or you nebulize yourself with albuterol, use uh, this ICS that we provide for free for the duration, the 15 month duration of the trial versus keep, do keep doing what your, your doctor tells you to do. That's called the apartic strategy, patient activated, reliever triggered, inhaled corticosteroid. We followed them monthly and it's, we, through different mechanisms, we retained the vast majority of these people completion rates like 95% uh, through the trial, which was pretty amazing. Um, these are the uh, these are the baseline characteristics. Well balanced. Notice that majority of obese, uh, many current or former smokers, current smokers. This is a pragmatic real world trial. Eff efficacy pharmaceutical trials don't allow for this. Two thirds regularly using nebulizers in the smart therapy trials. They were prevented from using nebulizers, and so were they in the Mandala trial for, with ICS Saba two-thirds with comorbidities. This is a highly impacted population. And what we saw was that the PARDIC strategy in blue reduced exacerbations. By how much? When you calculate by, uh, by excessive, severe exacerbations per person per year, it was 0 0.13 drop. In analogous smart therapy trials, it was 0 0.12, so um, comparable. We also saw improvements in asthma control, improvements in asthma quality of life, and reduction in uh, rescue inhaler refills. This is a comparison of the three strategies uh, uh, written with uh, Helen Riddell from uh, Gina and then Alberto Poppy from the Amandala trial. Um, this is the uh, uh, comparing SMART and albuterol budesonide and then the PARDIC strategy. 
the most data uh, available is for smart therapy. Um, but again, it's not FDA approved and it's not really been studied if you want to add other types of controller therapy regimens, which we have very many others, right? The problem uh, with uh, the good thing about uh, albuterol budesonide is it's a simple switch from an albuterol only inhaler. It's like take this other uh, albuterol containing inhaler. It only has an ICS. Um, it hasn't been studied in people who use nebulizers and we don't know how much this thing is going to cost. Uh, for the part strategy, um, it reduces exacerbation. It's compatible with FDA and healthcare plans, insurance plans. It's effective among nebulizer users, which is fairly common. It's actually very common, and we're working on some additional data on that. We still require, it's an extra inhaler. It's it's clunky. It's you, You're not only asking your patients to carry an albuterol, now it's two inhalers, and that just breeds non-adherence. That's, that's the problem. But we've submitted a new PCORI grant to compare SMART and uh, versus uh, PARDIX, a strategy we're going to, if successful, we're going to run it right here at USF. So I'll review inhaler technique and adherence and present to you some of the data from um, uh, residents and, and fellows. So one thing that we found uh, for the trial was every single questionnaire that we submitted to these 1,200 people, they, they were personalized because we found at the beginning during a pilot study that we did that when we used uh, terms like controller therapy or rescue therapy, people didn't know what we were talking about. So we decided, so let's call, let's use the terms. We had patient advisors actually that, that suggested this. Let's use the terms that the patient uses for their inhaler. And we started noticing that there's a wide range of uh, different inhaler names that people use. We decided to call some of them non-standard inhaler names and then start standard inhaler names. So for example, what's a non-standard inhaler name? One, for example, that's only a color. Oh, the red one. The red one can be ICS, uh, ICS for Motorol, or it can be Saba alone. I have no idea what that means. It Often they were called the puffer or la pompa or the machine. I have no idea what's in that puffer, right? And sometimes they even had unique names like Bob or friend. It's the list of unique names like that is is long and you can't you can't come up with that list. So we called that non-standard inhaler names. So we decided, so is there anything behind that? Does that tell us because we can quickly as clinicians ask them, what do you call this? And based on that, we found and this is after adjustment. So what is the impact of using a non-standard inhaler name on asthma morbidity measures like ED visits, usual care visits, or asthma attacks indicated by steroid burst or hospitalizations for asthma? This is after adjusting by age, gender, ethnicity, BMI, region of the country, smoking environment, years diagnosed with asthma, asthma controller regimen, regimen in other analyses by healthcare literacy and by education. And despite all of these, uh, uh, controlling for all of these different variables, just that simple question, what do, you, what do you call this puffer? If they gave you an answer like the red one or Bob, the Bob the inhaler, it's a 43% uh, greater incident rate ratio, 43%, let's call it risk. Uh, so. 43% greater risk of ED visits for asthma, 29% greater asthma attacks, 57% greater risk of uh, hospitalizations. We're still wondering what to do with, with this information next. I want to give you um, a brief um, update on what the latest American guidelines uh, addressed. One, allergen immunotherapy is helpful for asthma, and this is something that we can routinely bread and butter do uh, in the allergy division. Now you can add LAMA, long-acting muscarinic antagonists like Teotropium, Eumeclidinium, TICS and ICS lava, and it improves asthma control, reduces asthma attacks, improves lung function, used to be a COPD drug, and that's also FDA approved, indicated for asthma. Um, getting rid multiple interventions to get rid of uh, pest control, cockroaches, mice, uh, dust mites, improve quality of life. Bronchial thermoplasty may improve asthma control, but to be honest, 
whenever I present the patients, have a, you know, a, we're going to do a bronchoscopy and burn off some of your airway smooth muscle, uh, patients usually go for a biologic drug, just an injection to improve their asthma. And then FENO, this is something that we routinely do in our, uh, our clinics, point of care testing in 30 seconds, you have the response, and it tells you something about airway inflammation, it predicts ICS responsiveness, um, and can help you better manage asthma. This is from uh, Shilpa's review. These are the different biologic drugs that I mentioned before that targeted therapies to specific um, mediators important in asthma and uh, the dosage form and other different parameters. But regarding to that point, this is um, um, Bijal Patel's uh, internal medicine resonance uh, work. Um, she uh, she led this project. It's a survey study. I'm, I'm pretty sure that many of you in the audience uh, filled out this uh, this project, this survey. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to get at is uh, primary care physician familiarity with biologic therapy for asthma. Um, and this also goes to us and it speaks about a greater communication between allergists and pulmonologists and primary care physicians. And uh, because we found that at least 40% of us even in an academic institution, we're not really aware, familiar uh, with the existence of these biologic uh, therapies. This is important because two thirds of uncontrolled asthma in this country is managed by primary care physicians. Primary care physicians do most of the asthma work in this country. Biologic drugs are cost an eye and a hand they're very expensive, up to $50,000 a year per person. However, they're also very effective drugs. So it's it's not for everybody, but it might benefit some. 90% plus of all biologic therapy prescriptions are, are done or prescribed by, by uh, specialists, uh, allergists or pulmonologists, not by primary care physicians, unless they live in rural areas like Wyoming or something. Um, so the we can do something to bridge that gap, and I think uh, this uh, Bijel's research uh, highlights that. Um, going back to the GINA guidelines, one thing that's continuously in this wheel uh, asking clinicians uh, to do is to assess patient preferences. And on that, I want to showcase uh, the results by uh, Israel Ugalde, uh, now a, an interventional pulmonary fellow here at USF. Uh, he led this study where um, he surveyed from that prepared trial I told you about post-survey, post-trial, their preferences about asthma care visit types, in-person visits versus telehealth visits, and the clinical context and circumstances for their preferences. Also in a subset, he led efforts to extract data from electronic medical records where it was available and complete, found a reduced number but again, 98 is not is not nothing. It's almost 100 uh, uh, data points. Uh, comparing prospective asthma outcomes between uh, participants whose asthma care included telehealth versus those exclusively seen in person. Some of these data from USF. And he found that 41%, over 41% of Black and Latinx adults with moderate severe persistent asthma prefer regular asthma checkups through telehealth. This preference was uh, associated with being employed, as you can imagine, having lower self-reported asthma medication adherence. There's many uh, theories for that. And a history of more emergency department urgent care visits for asthma. And the thought there is maybe regular visits for asthma at a clinician, outpatient is hard for this patient population. And when they're having extreme asthma symptoms like an asthma attack, they just go to the ER and seek it there. So if we can do something like offer them telehealth, it might actually improve as asthma outcomes. But as we speak, efforts are being done to remove telehealth as a potential option uh, for uh, providing care for these patients. And again, N equals 98, but looking at ACT scores, asthma control, asthma quality of life, steroid asthma attacks, ED visits, hospitalizations, pretty similar, adjusted and unadjusted uh, between individuals uh, whose care included telehealth and, in, uh, and those who had exclusively in-person visits uh, for asthma care. 
uh, although that's those are exploratory analyses and we need uh, we need to validate that prospectively. Um, and this um, in terms of epidemiology and identifying highly impacted populations, so perhaps we can reduce morbidity overall um, by targeting those populations. These efforts are uh, were led by uh, Leah Ishmael, who just graduated from fellowship uh, in, uh, here at USF in the allergy division. Uh, she focused on this idea. So black individuals are disproportionately affected by asthma. So it's a greater prevalence than the nation and two to four times the rate of ER visits and mortality compared to non-black patients. Her thought was this, black adults living in the US are studied as a homogeneous group, which is not, despite obvious cultural, social, genetic differences with this population, right? And in fact, it's been documented that it all costs morbidity and mortality differs among uh, black ethnic subgroups, or for example, non-Latinx black adults born outside the, uh, the US have a uh, higher predicted 10 year risk of developing coronary disease versus black adults born out uh, in, sorry, those born here in the US had higher uh, coronary artery disease compared to those uh, black adults born outside of the US. Whether similar disparities in asthma morbidity exist among black ethnic subgroups is unknown. And she uh, sought to address this issue uh, with prepared data. So 744 black adults um, and she defined these were the subgroups multi ethnic black black participants who had self identified as black Latinx or other non African American black. So either heritage or born in the Caribbean continental Africa or other self-identified uh, black subgroup versus African-American black adults who are participants who self-identified as only African-American, not any of the above identities. So similar fo forest plot as the one for, um, that I showed you before, similar hospitalization rates, but for multi-ethnic black individuals close to having more asthma attacks compared to African-American Blacks and more ER visits for asthma, 32% higher odds after adjustment for age, BMI, comorbidities, education, and many many other important covariates. Uh, anything to, to the right of that horizontal line is greater risk for the multi-ethnic Black. That signal that I'm showing you on screen is even stronger if you look at black Latinx and that signal is even stronger if you look at Puerto Rican black individuals compared to others. So she's identified a subgroup of, of black patients who have, you have higher morbidity from asthma and it's likely to be driven by the use of ER, the ER to seek asthma care. So jumping to, to something else, um, other phenotype specific treatments, uh, like I said before at the beginning of the lecture, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. It's a unique uh, subset of asthma uh, characterized again by asthma nasal polyps, which are typically eosin which are eosinophilic and a stereotypical uh, respiratory reactions to NSAIDs like aspirin or naproxen. Obese asthma and then frequent bronch bronchitis. So look at this. Aspirin desensitization. So if you as allergists, something that we we can do for these patients is desensitize them to the drugs that provoke these respiratory reactions. And by doing so specifically with high dose aspirin, they get substantially better in terms of their nasal polyps and also their asthma. This is from Carlos Camargos's group. They looked at epidemiological study, large one, more than 2000 people from California before and after bariatric surgery, but look at that. The uh, gray 95% confidence interval doesn't even touch before and after in terms of asthma exacerbation rates. Any weight loss method that allows your patients to lose weight and keep it off will help substantially their asthma. And currently at USF, uh, we're designing a trial with a pharmaceutical intervention that can lose weight and therefore improve asthma control. We'd recruit these patients right here at USF. And this is from Peter Gibson's uh, Lancet paper, the AMAZIS trial, and essentially every other day dosing with azithromycin, a macrolide, 
which has, uh, of course, antibiotic activity, but also anti-inflammatory activity drops exacerbations by about 25%. This is now recommended in guidelines as well. So the third summary, inhaled corticosteroids for controller and rescue therapy are now the centerpiece uh, for asthma treatments. Asthma is heterogeneous, tailored treatment to your patient, and then do what you can to maximize adherence. Um, what clinical features or characteristic of asthma? I hope you can answer this. Clinical available asthma phenotype specific treatments and should albuterol alone be used as a reliever for asthma? Many thanks uh, for having me. And it's an honor for me to be here and talk about this. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of the work that the residents and fellows have, have done and I'll take any questions now. Happy Thank to share you. the reference. Thank you very much. No, outstanding and basically uh, perfect opening lecture for the year. 50 minutes, just absolutely the model uh, for what we like. So we have time for for questions. And I really, really appreciate uh, as vice chair of education, you tying in all the work of the internal medicine residents, uh, graduated allergy fellows, uh, pulmonary fellows. Really, you really taught touched on an important topic: how asthma just cuts through so many, so many things, right? Our internal medicine residency, allergy, pulmonology, uh, GI, as you mentioned, with reflux. Uh, I think that's why it's, and as you mentioned, the cost of asthma is, is, so, is, is, is so expansive and really want to um, uh, really, uh, all the residents and fellows outstanding, but really for Bijal Patel, really to recognize her for outstanding work. It's, it's difficult as a resident, even more challenging, you know, to to find that research protected time with the throes of going from ICU to wards, uh, having had the pleasure of working with Dr. Bajal Patel on wards during July and August. Uh, she is just an impressive, impressive resident and is going to have an incredible career. She'll be presenting um, her work at Anaheim uh, at uh, the AAI, uh, AAAI uh, this November. So congratulations to Dr. Bajal Patel. And we look forward to for representing USF in outstanding fashion in Anaheim, California in November. Uh, um, questions for Dr. Cardet. Dr. Menezes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Cardet, for that excellent lecture. Um, I had a question because, as you know well, uh, asthma is also a disease of poverty, not just here, all over the world. And you made, you, you said something about telehealth being removed as an option when your um, study very clearly showed it would be a great option for patients who I'm sure many of them being low income probably cannot come in for regular visits as well as it's hard to get appointments, um, you know, and this can help prevent exacerbations because you're providing support through regular follow up. Sometimes they might, as you pointed out, you know, they have different ways of, of naming their uh, inhalers, they, there are different ways they probably don't understand. And so this would be a supportive way, right? So I just couldn't, I didn't understand why that option would be removed or is being removed. You're asking me why it's being removed? Yeah, you said something about a telehealth option may be removed. I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, it, I, I mean, I, I don't mean it facetiously. It's it's um, the powers that, that be are, are, we had the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and suddenly providing telehealth was, became a high priority. And suddenly all of us were, were doing telehealth and it was spotty, but it was being reimbursed. But, but now that's, uh, that's, we're dwindling down and we're handling the uh, uh, COVID uh, differently now, that option is being, being taken away. I'm not sure who the uh, stakeholders are that that stand to gain most. I, I'm not sure who it's if it's um, insurance companies. I, I suppose it's insurance companies that stand to gain from removing telehealth as, as an option. Um, I, I all I know is that it's happening. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. Dr. Cardet, there are some questions in the chat. If you stop sharing your slides, you should be able to see them. Otherwise, I can read them for you. Stop sharing. Um, can you click on the chat button at the top? 
There's a, a question by Anna Negron. Uh, it, please, right. Yep. yep. Please discuss, explain how does allergy shots uh, work and any follow up besides following symptoms that could be, could be completed, could, could be measured after completing course. What is the reason skin testing is performed instead of blood to decide allergy shots therapy? Which antigens? Uh, thank you. So by providing the allergen um, that to which uh, people have this dysfunctional immune response, right, which is the uh, the definition of, of an aller allergic response, um, it causes uh, fundamental changes uh, to the immune response uh, to that allergen. Um, usually, uh, there is an increase in the number, for example, of IgG4 uh, antibodies that um, that seem to neutralize uh, IgE-mediated uh, 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 allergic reactions. That's one. That's one mechanism. Um, and um, there's a skewing also from that. Uh, remember that type two inflammatory response characterized by L4, 5, and 13. There's a skewing away from that that type of immunity and more uh, T regulatory cell driven immunity to that allergen which we provide. Um, that's that's a gross oversimplification to how allergy shots work, and happy to talk that in, uh, to you in detail uh, later. Um, that could be measured after completing the course. There's no reliable, unfortunately, there's no reliable predictor of who the person is um, that this this is what happens. Most most people after our official recommendation is to do a three to five year course of so subcutaneous immunotherapy or sublingual immunotherapy to allergens. And that is enough to have, provide a long lasting immunity. Um, and uh, efficacy in reducing rhinitis symptoms and asthma symptoms, three to five years. There's a subset of people, about 20% of so or so, so 80% don't, but 20% do, that do go back to having more symptoms after you stop the shots or the sublingual immunotherapy. There's no reliable way that I know of that you can measure point of care testing or even skin testing again that reliably predicts who is a persistent forever responder and who's not. I hope that helps. And then reason skin testing is performed instead of blood. If uh, uh, Fong Bradford is in the, the audience, uh, she hears me talk about this like all the time. This is like my pet peeve. Um, the literature says that um, specific serum specific IgE to allergens is almost as reliable, like 95% concordant with the sensitivity of skin tests. And in my, our experience, this is not the case at all. Um, and people say, I swear that I'm allergic to, let's say, oak trees, the most abundant tree species in Tampa Bay, right? And then you do the blood test and it's undetectable, but then you do the skin test and bam, it's there. Why? A possible reason, I'm not saying that this is the reason, but this is a possible reason is that the interaction between IgE and the FC epsilon receptor one for IgE that's present on mast cells, which are not peripheral blood and cells, but tissue dwelling cells, is one of the strongest affinities in existence in nature. So it's a siphon that sucks away uh, IgE from blood and draws it to, to tissue. So you can imagine why if you try to detect it in blood, it's not there. If you go to and test it in the skin, that's where it is. Um, hope that helps. Lucy Guerra has to do with reimbursement, telehealth visits, driven by insurance and issues with fraud. Yep. After the end of the public health emergency, CMS uh, reduced financial telehealth. Yep, it's a thing. It is still feasible to use telehealth, no longer reimbursed at the same rate as an in-person appointment. Um, yep. Um, but I, I wish um, some of the findings like like those of uh, Israel Galde and, and those of others uh, can influence decision makings like, uh, like this one. It has likely public health consequences. Um, thanks. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate that. All right, we echo the thoughts of Dr. Dennis Ledford. Uh, you are the epitome of the academic physician. 
Uh, it has been our, our pleasure to watch you just continue to flourish here at the University of South Florida College of Medicine in our Department of Internal Medicine. And we hope for many, many more years. And it's it's always a pleasure working with you, Juan Carlos. Thank you sure. for, an, again, an outstanding opening lecture for our Grand Round series. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week, next Thursday. So we're back on our 12 to 1 o'clock cycle. So we'll see you then and have a great Thursday afternoon. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much.